little structured reference journal. Okay. This is a joint work with Sean Bow, Markov Kohlweiss, and Sarah Mecklejohn. And basically what we were do, trying to do is we were trying to take these snarks, which have trusted setup, and we were trying to ask ourselves, is there a better way to do this trusted setup? So we're not getting rid of it entirely, but we're trying to mitigate the trust concerns to the point where they are not a concern. Well, hopefully not a concern. Um, why do we want SNARKs over other protocols? I mean, certainly you saw that there are lots of choices when it comes to zero knowledge this morning, and SNARKs have some trade-offs which are better in some cases and worse in other cases. But one thing that they have which is very nice is that verification is very, very small. So typically you would be talking a couple of pairing equations per proof, and that would be at. Whereas in other schemes, you almost always have this logarithmic factor going on, where you're going to be trying to represent the circuit in some kind of way where the verifier is going to query and then the person is going to respond. And this overhead that you're going to get from that, for some applications it might not be a problem, but for other applications where your verifier might be very time constrained, you, are, you might be in a situation where you're willing to accept a slightly higher prover, for example, and slightly less nice assumptions in order to get that down. The problem that we have with these snarks is that they have to have a trusted setup. And what we mean here is that zero knowledge necessarily, by definition, has a trapdoor. In any construction you care to mention, there will exist some trapdoor which can be used to forge proofs. So that doesn't mean that you will be able to tell the difference between this proof and that proof, this witness, that witness. It cannot be used to break anonymity, but it can be used to break integrity all of the time. And this is quite serious. Like, if you can break the integrity of your zero-knowledge proof, why are you using your zero-knowledge proof in the first place? So are you just calling integrity as synonymous with the soundness? Or yep. Okay. Yes, I am. Because, OK, maybe you're in the situation where you do have some magical party in the sky that's totally trusted who's not going to corrupt your scheme. But oftentimes you don't. You don't trust anyone. And now we're stuck in a situation where we have a scheme which we essentially can't use. But of course, I wouldn't be talking here if that was actually the case. Certainly if we're talking um, proofs which aren't snark proofs, but things like bullet proofs, things like Starks, what they have is they have a transparent setup. So that means even though there technically exists a trapdoor, the way the parameters are chosen is at random. And therefore, we are able to take a randomized algorithm where we release all of the public coins, input that into the setup, and then we're fairly sure that what comes out of the setup is going to make it so that nobody knows the trapdoor. Still exists, but nobody knows it. Even, even if you use the, the old zero string as a seed for start, uh, still it's not, it's, it's a trapdoor, you mean in the sense that there exists uh, some bad proof, but it's yep, not. Yeah, there exists a simulator. Randomness, right? You can use, maybe you can say that randomness is built into the design of SHA-256, but in practice, if you seed a Stark with randomness of the old zero string, it would still not be broken in a practical sense, right? I mean, in the case of Starks, I'm thinking about it as the simulator would have a way to manipulate the hash function, because that is what the simulator does in the proof, so they would have some kind of way to program the hash function to give it the answer that they wanted. Okay. Uh, okay, not, not sure for, for soundness. Uh, are you talking about zero knowledge or soundness? Yeah. Soundness. I think soundness, at least of the things I'm familiar with, is proved in non programmable random oracle, and zero knowledge is proved in the explicitly programmable random oracle. So, as far as I recall, the trapdoor is formally needed for zero knowledge. I'm not aware of it being needed for soundness. But if you have a zero knowledge scheme, then you will have a simulator, so there will be at least one party who is able to cheat the simulator. Yes, but because you have zero knowledge, that does impact your soundness. You can still put soundness in the 
Right. We can take it offline, but I, I think it's an interesting discussion. I'm not sure how to promote, promote it necessarily. But the problem with snark parameters over the Stark parameters that you were talking about, and certainly lots of other schemes, is that they are not actually chosen at random. They have a very high degree of structure, and we have to somehow find a way to generate um, parameters with these structure such that we can still build proofs, but that nobody knows the underlying elements which have been used. So, just a couple of diagrams to illustrate that. If you have NISIC parameters, you're going to have just a mess. You're going to have lots of things which are chosen at random, whereas if you have SNARK parameters, you're going to be very carefully constructing them to be exactly of the format that you want. So how can we use these SNARKs if we're now in a situation where their parameters are difficult to generate? Essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to do a multi-party computation in order to generate the parameters. So we're going to need lots and lots of parties taking part, and we want to be able to say that provided one of these parties is honest, then nobody in the entire scheme can know the trapdoor. And it doesn't matter where that honest par party happens to have put it participated. So here each participant is going to learn just a little bit of the secret as you need all of the secrets to put together in order to be able to construct the trapdoor in order to be able to build the simulator to break the snark. So in prior works it used to be the case that the way people would do this is they would do an MPC for each individual application which they were trying to build. So you would have one set up for range proofs, one set up for Zcash, one set up for Coda, and any other application you care to name. And each of those uh, companies that are running these things would have to do their own, uh, their own ceremony in order to get their own parameters. And what's more, if they got it wrong, if they happened to somewhere in their code have mistakenly forgot a minus sign, they then have to run the whole ceremony again. <coughs> Which is like not just a theoretical concern, I think this is quite a practical concern because mistakes happen all the time. So the difference that we have in our Sonic setup is that it is universal. And this means, provided your setup is okay, which is a big provided, but assuming it is, you can then take the parameters from that and you can build any application which you care to think of. Up to a given size, we do have a size bound, <laughs> but provided you can represent your scheme within this number of constraints, if you need to make a change, that's fine, just change it. So in previous setups, the way they would do it is in this sort of two round protocol. So they would start off with some kind of reference string. Someone would come along and add a little bit more of a th to the secrets underlying the reference string. So this is called an update in order to generate the next string. Somebody else would come in, they'd take the second reference string and then they would update it again in order to produce the third reference string. Okay? And but the thing is, this first phase does not depend on the circuit, whereas they needed something which does depend on the circuit. So they would then go into a phase two. And once you start phase two, you cannot edit phase one. And phase two is going to work much the same way, but you start with something which is already structured. And then you update upon your structured thing, but you cannot... Um, change the thing that you start with without rerunning round one. Okay. Once you start phase two, this guy's fixed. In Sonic, we get rid of the second round. So we can just use the first round with these global reference strings, no dependence on the application for whatever we happen to be building. The system I was describing here, where you have one person update, then the next person update, then the next person update, we call this property updatability. 
And yeah. what it means is that if one party at any point in time is not colluding with all other parties, then the resulting parameters will be fine. Which means that if you have a particularly distrustful user who says, I don't think that your setup is okay, I think that every single one of you is colluding, you could theoretically just incorporate them into the setup without it being a big deal. Um, but one downside is we cannot make any guarantees about the security of the SNARKs which were created before the honest party participated. Our update proofs are very, very small. And we don't need to store the reference strings. We only need to store the update proofs. So we need the final reference string. And we need the reference strings which are used to verify things. But these are also quite small. The actual in-between steps with these linear sized reference strings, we don't need to keep those around, which is quite a nice property. Our actual reference strings which we're going to be using are linear sized. So this is essentially equal to the output of one of the trusted setups of um, say GROT16. So only the current reference string needs to be stored. And um, we have got the parameters down to a size where they could be stored, verified, and updated on a personal laptop. You wouldn't need to have any kind of distributed system in order to get these parameters. Okay. If we're talking about actually doing these things where the verifier is smaller than the prover, then this is actually impossible because the verifier needs to read the program. The way we get around this is that we have this sort of one-time der derivation process where we take in the output of the trusted setup, we do some kind of public computation to it in order to get some re structure into there, and that's the actual um, reference string that we'll be using for this application-specific thing. So if we're talking Sonic, then Sonic does do this, and we get proofs which are constant sized. But actually, the asymptotics aren't that great. Uh, not the asymptotics, the practical constants aren't that great. They're quite, quite large. It was a feasibility result, this part. But where we do get good constants, and where we are in a situation where we're able to say we are competitive with the state of the art to use our scheme, is when you're not just producing one proof, but you're producing many, 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 many proofs. So if you're thinking cryptocurrencies, these are a classic example of that. If you're a node, you're not going to be verifying a single transaction. You're going to be given all of the transactions in a block, and you're going to verify them all at the same time. And if you're doing that, then this is precisely the kind of situation where Sonic is going to help you. Um, so repent in my head. So what we're going to have is we're going to have proof one, I'm going to call it pi one just because it's easier, pi two, pi three, pi four, etc. These are all generated by different parties, okay? Or they could be generated by the same party, it doesn't matter. And then you're going to have some kind of aggregating party, or help as we're calling them. But the aggregator isn't here to reduce proof size. They are here to reduce verifier time. So what they're going to do is they're going to compute some kind of advice string. And then our actual verifier, with access to the advice string and all of the proofs is going to run in a time which is um, constant in the number of proofs and um, depending on the size of the circuit as a one-off cost when it's checking the advice and provided both check out you get something which is very efficient in this batch setting. Yes. In the 
the cache setting, right? Who's gonna update the CRS? And so is the prover gonna use the last updated CRS? Yeah. And but maybe I don't trust. I mean, so, so how do we know which CRS we should use, right? Maybe there were there were like thousands of updates. Okay, so you definitely. Well, <coughs> I probably wouldn't post the actual um, reference string from the blockchain. I guess you could, but that would be pretty inefficient. I would probably just post a um, certainly a pointer to where you can find it. And then if you're looking for the update proofs, these you can store on your laptop. And you could very much have it so that somebody else who has participated in the scheme can point to their proof and say that proof is mine. Because the update proofs are they're small, they're like three proof elements, uh, three group elements. <coughs> so you can keep those around? No, I mean, when I'm proving, do I also have to indicate which CRS I'm using? Because there I'm are- I'm assuming there would need to be some consensus about which, um, or which reference string you're using, yes. So we should define in advance which CRS all provers are using? Uh, Yes, I think we should. I mean, this is something where you can every now and again, maybe once a day, say, move to the next reference string, move to the next reference string. But I don't, I think in terms of like actually making it so that the system ran very smoothly, having it so that people were all using the same reference string would be certainly much better if we're wanting to do this um, aggregating trick. Yeah, no, because I, so my fear was that the whole point of this updating is that I don't trust anybody, right? So I want to make my own update. I'm the very far uh, I wouldn't say that's the point of it. I would say the point is that with an MPC, you have to, um, you have some fairly strict time deadlines on when you have to have completed your MPC by. Whereas with our one, we can run it over an entire year if we want to, in order to get sufficient participants. Like we don't have to have this sort of thing where the first round ends and the second round begins. I certainly wouldn't go live with the system if I wasn't sure that there had been enough updates. Put it that way. Later in time, if you don't trust the setup that someone did 10 years ago, you can still update again. But. So we can just, in terms of like intuition of how you would use this, are you thinking like, I want to create a new blockchain, I'm just going to start with the trusted setup of an existing blockchain and add a bunch more setup, but then if people trusted the original blockchain, they should still trust mine? Or are you thinking like, this thing changes every year, and if so, say you have like a pre-signed transaction you hadn't submitted yet, would that then be a problem? Like anything that was signed in advance would get kind of expire after a year? Um, so you would have to keep the reference string under which the signature was generated around. But you could potentially have like a single blockchain where you're verifying proofs under two different reference strings. Like maybe we could oh yeah, of course you could. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure you'd want to, but you could. No. Who is generating the thing in which order may not leave any secrets? You can just use some normal not secrecy preserving blockchain in order to verify that to get a sequencing right. Well, I'm just saying, like, sometimes you want to, like, have a transaction but not submit it. So, if, like, the reference string under which these proofs are, is going to, like, change every year or something, that could be annoying. So, I'm wondering if that is annoying or. I don't think once a year would be annoying. Once a minute would be annoying, but once a year would. Well, it depends. I mean, it <laughs> would be all right. In, in December, someone gives you something you don't intend to submit to the blockchain for another three months. Maybe there's even, you even want to have a time lock transaction where it like pays out, but you can only submit it in three months. Um, but that's a private transaction. But if you have the witness, then you could always reprove the witness and just new parameters. Oh, I see. So the, re the recipient could actually read you the proof. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the assumptions we're making about these health is that they is that they have a fairly large amount of computational resource. Not ridiculously large, but they are going to have to do a linear amount of work per prover. Um, we do not want to trust them. If we trusted them, it would almost ruin the point of doing the proofs in the first place. We want them to verify every single thing that they're telling us. Um, so we are also assuming that helpers cannot communicate with the original provers. And this is quite a big restriction. This um, limits the ways, in, well, it's a, it's a good thing. But in terms of building the proof, it made it a bit harder. But in terms of actually using the proofs, it makes it a lot easier. It means you don't have to have some kind of interaction channel going between the prover and the helper. 
Um, they can aggregate proofs to reduce the verifier's overhead. The sense of cannot here is not, it's not shall not, it's more like does not need to. Does not need to, yes. And in blockchain applications, you'd probably make it miners' duty. But I can see other applications, for example, if you have a very parallel prover where you would make it the prover's responsibility in that case. So yeah, we have M constant size proofs and one helper proof. The helper proof requires linear work to verify, but this is a one-off cost. And the um, constant size proofs that's going to cost m times the number of proofs in order to verify them. So with this helper, we can achieve very good concrete efficiency, not just in terms of verifier time, but also proof size. We have four group elements, two field elements. Which is so the state of the art in the um, non-universal case is GROT16, which is three group elements. So we're about double that, but not more. John implemented it. He also helped design it. Well, was a big part in designing the scheme, but I cannot take any credit for the implementation is what I mean when I say, I'm saying that. And it can be found on the address that you can see. And when we were taking timings, we were finding pretty much what we were expecting. We were finding that when you had this helped verifier, the amount that they had to spend in effort verifying the individual proofs was very, very low but we were paying some overhead in terms of prover time. This is standard for SNARKs. They usually have quite, quite heavy d um, duty provers. And again, our helper was impacted by the size of the circuit. This is expected. Uh, recently, um, Sean and others from Zcash introduced a way in which you could implement Sonic without a trusted setup. Um, the idea is that you take they're very much using this helper setting. If you don't have a helper, then the tricks they're using here do not work. But if you do have a helper, then what they do is they notice that the bulletproof verifier is something which you can generate an advice string for. And if you have the advice string, then you can check all of the bulletproof proofs in one go. That's making the individual marginal costs, is what we were calling them, quite small. So if we don't have a helper, I mentioned before that we're not doing so great here. In terms of proof size, it's not too bad, but the prover time is very, very high to the point where I, every single time where I count it, I get a different result. So don't trust the numbers in the paper too much. Uh, recently, there have been two works which have been introduced which try and tackle this problem, one of which I am a co-author on with Ali and others. And this is where, specifically for the setting where you don't have a helper. And this might, for example, happen when you're trying to verify the output of a random beacon. If you have a random beacon, then you're only going to have something you need to verify once every while because it only outputs things every now and again. So you definitely don't want to be in a situation where you can only prove things efficiently if you have a helper because you only have one proof. So in this setting, Marlin managed to get the prover down to roughly four times the state of the art in the non-universal setting. And we were pretty pleased with this. Again, proofs are constant sized. Um, and the way we did it was with a um, derivation process where we were taking our R1CS matrix and we were having an indexer which is able to only pick out the relevant entries in the matrix. Whereas with Sonic, we weren't able to do that if you have a very sparse matrix and um, then you would end up having to have a polynomial commitment scheme that took that into account and it would all get difficult. So we introduced a permutation argument to get around that and it got quite messy, whereas this was a much cleaner approach. In both approaches, we are using a polynomial commitment scheme. It's a big trick. It's something by Kate and others. You send a polynomial, someone responds with a challenge, and you say, this is the uh, output of the polynomial, and you check it. Uh, but with Sonic, we had a bivariate polynomial. 
And this was a really, really technical, challenging thing about the paper, that how do you deal with bivariate polynomials? Um, so we had something of the form S of X, Y. It's a public polynomial. There's no secrets in it, but the verifier has to know its evaluation at some point. So essentially the way we did this is we took, in the help setting, we take in lots of polynomials, well, committed polynomials at lots of points, and we try to say, how do we know that these commitments are correct? So first of all, we send them to our verifier, or we hash them. Lots of polynomials are uh, the same polynomial evaluated on multiple. The same polynomial evaluated on multiple points. Lots of the same polynomial evaluated on multiple points. Hash them in order to get some kind of challenge or an oracle response. And then we're going to commit the S to Y. And then we're going to need to send a proof that our commitment to S of ZY is correct. And we're also going to need to check that the opening of S of ZY at Y1 is equal to the opening of S of XY1 at Z. And the same for this one, the same for that one, all the way along. And the trick here is that they can only be equal if they were, if the original one was in fact computed correctly. And the proof that this thing is computed correctly, while it's linear, you only have to check it once. So just to sum up, trusted setups can be instantiated badly, and when they are instantiated badly, they are bad news. But there are ways where you can do them well. And if you do do a very carefully thought out trusted setup where you're picking, uh, deciding how people are taking part very carefully and you're making sure that it's a very open and um, transparent process, then this is much easier to do with a setup which is updatable and universal. Certainly because if you have many setups for many different applications, then, um, then you know, auditors would have to check all of your different setups, whereas in this case, they only have to check one. Um, with a helper, Sonic has very small concrete overhead, <coughs> and with Alpha Helper, there are other systems, some of which I think you might hear about later this week, which have some good concrete overhead. Thank you very much. Any questions? How do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> so we started from the bulletproof scheme and we embedded one of the challenges, but not both. Because usually you would embed both challenges when building snacks, but this time we only embedded one into the common reference string. And then after we embedded one, we were there saying, how can you check that the rest of the stuff is valid? And this is where we were really struggling with this um, a bivariate polynomial because even though it's sparse, the sparseness doesn't help you if you're trying to commit to it because polynomial commitments in bivariate things are um, quadratic. But by being able to take it into the random oracle model and say, if you have all of these things and you want to prove that they're um, computed correctly at the same time, can you do that? We realized that actually this was very doable. So this N on the board, how does that relate to like the computation? The number of uh, things that you're aggregating. Okay. So if you're only aggregating one thing, you, you would not do this, it would be a waste of time. But if you're aggregating 10 things, it gets better. And if you're aggregating 100 things, it gets better. And the more things you're aggregating, the better it is for the verifier. And by aggregating, you, this is with the helper? This is with the helper, okay. yes. So yeah, we're not a shrinking proof size anything the proof size grows a little bit, but we are making it so that the verifier has to do much less work. And what is the tipping point? The tipping point? How many, from how many number of proofs it gets very good? Does it look very good now? Um, 
That probably depends on the size of your circuit, actually. So it would be hard to give you a precise number. Because certainly, if you're just talking one proof, then even though our work is linear, it would um, still be linear in the field rather than linear in terms of so proof exponentiation. So it wouldn't be that bad. So you probably would more be seeing the effects with very <coughs> large circuits. And the larger the circuit, the more proofs you're going to need. Sorry, the smaller the circuit, the more proofs you're going to need before it comes worth it. Any more questions? Thanks, man. <laughs>